Hello, Facebook family. It is so good to see you. Um, I am going to just jump right in because I want to give you an encouraging word today. So today I want to talk about taking back your power over fear and anxiety. So I know that it's still a lot going on. So I definitely want to put this information out there and pray that it's something um, that will help you guys. Um, but we talked about the wellness line last time. And so just to recap that um, be it for your spiritual, your physical or your mental state, the wellness line is the point in which you are able to function at a level that is considered regular normal. And it's important for this segment um, just for you to understand that uh, the anxiety and the fear that we have does have an effect on our well-being and our spiritual state of mind also has an effect on our physical and our mental stability and vice versa. And so I just wanted to talk to you guys about that a little bit today. Now, I know that ever since sin entered into this world, fear has been present. There's no getting around it. We're in these human bodies and that's exactly what we're going to have. We're going to have fear, but we don't have to accept it. And stress does attack our body's wellness line. So Yes, I do have access to uh, natural uh, anxiolytics uh, or anxiolytics that can pacify anxiety through um, neurological connections in your brain that's stimulated by your sense of smell. And I can attest that the supplements work to ease the stress or anxiety. But today, I want to talk to you about the one who heals anxiety. And so um, if you would uh, like to talk to me about those natural pieces that um, you can take or you can diffuse, by all means, you're welcome to contact me uh, by messenger or email, or you can call my business line or check out my website. All that information is there on my uh, Facebook page for It's a Natural Life. But I just want to make sure that we know that healing is available through God. And I know that uh, all of the natural supplements have their place. And I know that medicine has its place as well. So again, I'd be happy to talk to you about those things. If you want to private message me, that's no problem at all. But I want to make sure that we're talking about the fact that through Jesus, we can be healed of anxiety and depression and panic attacks and, and fear. And I want to encourage you to overcome it. I want to encourage you to be victorious. I want to encourage you to be healed from it. And the only way I know that healing is available is through God. And so I want to take you uh, to the word of God and take a look at 1 John, the fourth chapter and the 18th verse. And it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So when I look at this scripture and me just being a Christian for so many years, I still struggle um, at times when I'm in the thick of things with being able to process this scripture. And when it comes down to my kids, I can be downright terrified depending on the situation. And it really takes processing this scripture and it's worth it. It is worth it to take the time to process the scripture, to remember the things that God has given us and the tools and the resources that he's given us through his word to be able to overcome that fear. 
Because truth be told, it is empowering to understand God's love for us, to understand how much he loves us, to understand what it means for you, for God to love you. So I really want us to be able to grasp the scripture. And so uh, just to kind of uh, tie some things together, I, I'm a Die Hard fan of the movie Die Hard, and I love all of them. Every single last one of them, I could watch them over and over again. And uh, one of my favorites is Live Free or Die Hard. And this is the one where Bruce Willis plays the part of John McClane. And uh, he is this guy that just takes on whatever you throw at him um, for the sake of saving people and, and protecting those. And in this particular one, his daughter, Lucy, had been kidnapped. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, that was just a bad decision <laughs> on the part of the bad guys. But the reason that I'm fond of this particular one is because of Lucy's attitude throughout the movie. She was kidnapped, but because she knew that her father was involved, she did not back down. She did not show fear. She was mouthing off to the bad guys, telling them, my dad's going to make you pay. Like, you going to get it. Like, she was a tough cookie because she knew that her father loved her so much that no matter where she was, he would go to the ends of the earth to find her and rescue her. And so I really appreciate that movie. And then the climax of the movie is when um, Lucy McLean is being held by gunpoint. And John McClane finally finds where she is and he gets to her location and he's beat up and he's bruised and he's barely walking, limping. He's just been through it trying to get to his daughter. And now he's being also held by gunpoint by a different bad guy. And so John McClane saves the day by taking the hand of the bad guy and forcing his hand to for him to be shot through his own shoulder and kill the bad guy that's standing behind him. Ah, oh, man, it was awesome. But when I really sit down and I think about it, I think that all too often we think about God in the way John McClane's character is presented on the screen. And I think that we sometimes see God as this person who is barely hanging on to life to rescue us and it is searching for us and trying to catch up to the enemy and figure out his plan in order to rescue us. And then when God doesn't sum up and, and solve all of our issues within two hours, you know, that normal span of time that a movie takes place, then we begin to give up on the hope that he is able to take care of us or able to, uh, to rescue us or save us or protect us. And I just have to let you know that God is not this, you know, modern day superhero that has to find us and figure out the enemy's plan. No, 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 no. That, that's not who our God is. God is a very present God. He's already where we are. He already knows exactly how to, 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 to protect us and how to, to strengthen us and how to give us the peace that we need. God is almighty and all seeing and all knowing. And I'm so excited because from the beginning of time, he showed his love for us by providing man with every single thing man would need. Everything. Before he even created us, he created the things that we would need. And that goes from day and night, moon and stars and the seas and the land and the grass and the fruits and the vegetables and animals above and below the seas. You see, he provided for us first. So we wouldn't need for anything. 
And he made us male and female so that we would not be alone and could have family to surround us. And so oftentimes the question is asked how a good and loving God could allow death and hardship. And so I look at Genesis 3.15. And at the very time of Adam and Eve's sin, God revealed the first glimpse of his plan to redeem humanity. In this verse, God is speaking to the serpent. And just to give you a little background, that at the beginning of, of, of the creation of this earth, there was no sin. There was no evil. There was uh, man was able to eat of whatever he wanted except for one tree in the garden. The garden had a tree called uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the man didn't know anything about evil, right? He had no knowledge of it before th these verses in chapter three took place. But the enemy did. Satan did. The serpent did. And so when the serpent tricked the woman, Eve, into partaking of this one tree, disobedience came in. But when the man that she went to her husband, Adam, and he ate with her, when he took of that bite of that fruit, at that moment, sin came into the world, to this world that God created, this earth. And in that moment, there had to be consequences for the disobedience that took place. And the serpent had consequences, the woman had consequences, the man had consequences, right? And so in this verse, verse 15, God is speaking to the serpent and telling him what his consequences are for the deception that, that he did, right? And so this verse, and I'll read it in the, the King James Version, and um, instead of thus and thou's and these, I'll say you and your, so it just makes it a little bit easier to understand. Um, but it says in Genesis 3 and 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, again, God is talking to the serpent here. So when you're studying the Bible, it's important, first off, to pray and ask God for understanding and wisdom in your studies, okay? But also, if you have it available to read different versions of it, because it's like different languages, you have your English and your French and your Spanish, and depending on which language you understand, then it just helps you to get the bigger picture, right? And so the different versions of the Bible break it down um, in different ways of saying the same thing so that no matter what your background is, no matter what your education may be, no matter what you've been exposed to, that you're able to understand the word of God. And so if you have that available, you want to use that and you also want to use a dictionary. You want to pay attention to pronouns and prepositions because in verse 15 of the King James Version, I want you to notice that um, it uses the word it and it says it shall bruise your head, but then turns around and it says, you shall bruise his heel. So the use of the word it and his needs clarification. So another point to remember when studying the Bible is that the entire Bible ties together and it is not contradictory. So in the times that it seems to be contradictory, that's a red flag that you need more scriptures in order to understand the message. So at this point in my studies, I would do a search for the word bruise. Um, and I could use a concordance and a concordance. What it does is it's an exhaustive list of the location of every single word in the Bible. And the book is like that, that thick. <laughs> it's a pretty thick book. So it is definitely every single word in the Bible. It tells you where you can find it. Or you can go to a resource that I like called um, Gateway, BibleGateway.com. And so when you go to BibleGateway.com, you can just type in the word bruise and you can um, pick which version of the Bible you want to use. And a lot of times I go through different versions so that I get the word every single time it's listed. Um, and so with that, there were two scriptures 
that stood out pretty clear to me to point to Christ regarding that Genesis 3.15. And so the first one was Isaiah 53 and 5, which says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. And so the second one says, it's Romans 16 and 20. And it says, the God of peace will bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so here you see two scriptures that are talking about bruising and it references peace and it references the power of Christ over Satan. And it ties back to that Genesis 3.15, because if you were to, if in order for you to have your foot on top of something, right, it has to be a lifting and a putting back down. Because if you were kicking it, it would be at the front of your foot, right? If you were pushing it aside with your foot, if you were doing that, then it would be on the side of your foot. But because it says under your foot, you know that it's a lifting and a putting down. So there's a lifting and a crushing. There's a lifting and a stomping on Satan's head. Okay, and so that's what we see here in uh, Genesis 3.15, where God is telling the serpent, you're going to bruise its heel, but he's going to turn around and he's going to bruise your head, right? He's, your, your head is going to be under his foot. So it's awesome that there's going to be a crushing and a stomping there. And so um, with this, you know, other versions also rightfully change out the word it for his. Now, for me, um, because it says it, that is something that represents Christ, maybe his power, his uh, redeeming power, his uh, resurrection. And so his resurrection is crushing the enemy's head, is totally destroying the enemy, right? And so uh, other versions of the Bible, it replaced the word it and they say he, and that is also in line with the word because you go back to Romans 16 and 20. And so Romans 16 and 20, remember it says that God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet, under your feet shortly. And I love that it says shortly because that's just in a little while. And so it's God says that our day to us is but a thousand I mean, a thousand days to us is but a day to him. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially when you're a kid, that some things just seem to take forever. If mom says that she's going to buy you something at five o'clock and it is 430, it's like every minute that passes by it takes so long. But it's just fleeting time to God. And so he says in a short while. So we are to just hold on. And I love that in both of these, all three of these scriptures, is in all, I'm sorry, in both of the scriptures that refer back to Genesis 3.15, it's talking about our peace, that he's overcoming the enemy for our peace. And so we know that peace is the opposite of anxiety, the opposite of fear. Right. So definitely wanting to just praise God for that. And so we see right here that as soon as man failed, God showed his love for man in that moment that God loved us enough to have a place, a plan in place to redeem us. And where we once thought that, you know, the introduction of death here in these verses, because later it talks about, uh, he's talking to Adam, he's talking to the man, and he's talking about, you know, that his days would now be numbered, right? And so he wouldn't live forever, um, eternity on earth, that there was now going to be a death that came along uh, with this life. But that's in verse 19 of chapter three of Genesis. And oftentimes we saw that as a punishment. I remember early on thinking that that was a punishment, but it's not. 
It's actually an act of love through mercy for man to not have to live forever in this world of sin, in this world of chaos where our bodies get tired and sick and disease, where there's pain and anguish, where there's heartache and turmoil and tribulation. So you see, God loved us from the very beginning, before we even knew him. The enemy did not take God by surprise. God already had a plan in place. God knew how he would redeem us from the beginning. He didn't have to play catch up. His sin, yes, sin came into this world and brought on hardships and God allowed it. He allows it, but he does not want us to go through it alone. He doesn't want us to go through it without having peace. He doesn't want us to go through it without having comfort. He doesn't want us to go through it without having joy. He is there with us already. He doesn't need to find us. He's already right where we are. And he's waiting for us to accept the love that he has for us. For knowing that he loves us, understanding his love for us drives out fear, knowing that he does not want to see us destroyed and that he does not want to see us fall apart. Jesus gave his very life for mankind who was created through him. That's why Jesus took the steps to be on the cross because we were made through him. To know that when you're scared, we have Matthew 28 and 20 that says that he is with us always, even to the ends of the earth. And when you've lost an income, Philippians 4.19 says, God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And when you believe God is giving you a job to do and you run into an obstacle, that you can rely on Philippians 1 and 6 and being confident in this, that the one who began a good work woo, in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so when you feel like you don't have the ability or the strength to do something, then you can rely on Philippians 4 and 13 that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when people are trying to tear you down, you have Psalms 56 that reminds us to ask the question, what can mere mortals do for me? When God is on my side and when I'm sad, I can tell you that I lean on Psalms 56 and 8 that tells me that God keeps track of all of my sorrows and collects my tears in a bottle. Then Psalms 30 reminds me that weeping, it may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. And so when sickness comes, you have Jeremiah 33 and 6 that says that God will bring healing. And in times of death, you have Corinthians 15, you have 1 Corinthians 15 and 54 that says that this mortal body will become immortal. And we can say to death, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? So the peace, the joy, the comfort all comes from accepting the perfect love of God that drives out fear. And it starts with a relationship with Christ. And if you are a believer, meditate on these words of God, 
his scriptures day and night until the words connect with you and you're able to apply them to your life. Once you are at the point of a relationship with God, and that's Romans 10 and 9, that says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, now, I just want to stop right there and talk about what it means for you to confess that Jesus is Lord. Calling him Lord, yes, that means that he's your savior. Yes, it means that he is your, your master, your king, your guide, your shepherd, right? That's what it means. But when you're also confessing that Jesus is Lord, it means that you are saying that you believe and that you acknowledge that he's not just a good man that walked the earth at some point in time. He's not just a prophet. He's so much more than that, that he is the son of God and that he is God. Jesus said that I come that you may have life and that you have it more abundantly. That you have it more abundantly. And so that peace of God is available for us. So getting back to Romans 10 and 9, and it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's enough for you believe that he is risen. It's enough for you to call him Lord, for you to be saved from the wages of sin. But I am here to tell you that if you have the understanding that his death and resurrection was not just so that we would have eternal life in heaven, but that it is for us right now here on this earth to have the things that we need from him on this earth, peace, joy, comfort, healing, be able to overcome addictions right here, to come against anxiety, to come against fear, to come against depression, right now to be able to come against panic attacks, he is risen for us right now. And so having a relationship with him brings about that understanding of how much he loves you. I don't know a married couple that has a good relationship that never spend time with each other, who never see each other, who don't know anything about one another. If you want to have a relationship with God, if you want to understand how much he loves you, it's going to require us spending some time with him. There is so much social media going on right now that is positive, where people are teaching the word of God, talking about the word of God, reading the word of God, praying online. And you want to be able to tap into that because you want to be able to hear all the good news that you can to get to know about God's love. There's so many many teachers online right now and you make sure that they give you a scripture to go to and then you go back to the word of God and read that scripture for yourself and make sure that the lesson they taught lines up with love. Make sure that the lesson they taught lines up with what the word of God says, that what they read was what the Bible says and that nothing was mixed up and screwed. We have to take responsibility for our own relationships with Christ. And so I'm so excited because all he wants us to do is to know how much he loves us and accept and walk in his love. There's so many benefits of having a relationship with God. And so as you continue to study, as you continue to learn about him, you'll understand more and more about how his love drives out fear about how understanding his perfect love drives out fear and the benefits of the peace and the joy and the tranquility and the healing and how he supplies those things here on earth. So I say again, Romans 10 and 9, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead so that you will be saved saved from anxiety, saved from the depression, saved from the wages of sin, which is death. If you remember us talking about Adam and Eve and 
how they messed up at the beginning. You see, they were not clothed. They were naked at the beginning of this earth. They didn't know that they were naked. They didn't know to be ashamed. But as soon as they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, then they looked and they saw that they were naked. They understood what it was and they were ashamed. And so God covered them with animal's fur, with animal skin. And in order for that to happen, in order for that to take place, an animal had to die. Blood had to be shed. So the wages of sin is death. Something has to die. And Jesus took that on for us. He took on that death for us so that this natural body may very well pass away at some point, but our souls will live eternally with him. So that's just going back to 1 John 4 and 18, where again it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love dries out fear. And that next line is so important because it says fear has to do with punishment. When you think about that, we are punishing ourselves when we are accepting fear and anxiety. Fear is torment. Fear is, is, is a stabbing pain. It's, it's high blood pressure. It's migraines. It's a, a weakened immune system. Anxiety comes in and brings about heart attacks and, and strokes. We are punishing ourselves when we accept anxiety and fear in our lives. And I'm talking about that trembling, paralyzing fear that captivates your mind, captivates your wellness, captivates your ability to function, captivates your ability your ability to achieve, to progress, to do, to win, to be victorious, to be healed. That's the type of fear that we are now holding captive by the word of God today, trusting and believing that his love will carry us through. You know, I, I, I tell you that this verse about love driving out fear is so wonderful and illuminating because when we understand that God doesn't want to destroy us, when we have an understand uh, an understanding of how much he loved us, that he that we are a part of him made through him, so he loves himself, so he loves us. You see, oftentimes we think about the sin that we do and the mess ups and the mistakes, and we don't think that we're worthy to be loved. We don't think that we uh, should be loved, that we deserve it. And there's nothing that we've done or it can ever do to deserve God's love. He loves us because we are a part of him. He loves us because he made us through him. He loves us just because he's God and he's love. And so God certainly is not going to hate himself. And we were made in his image. So because of that, we have his undying, his perfect, his empowering love. And so God wants us to be able to stand boldly in the midst of our circumstances to be able to stand flat-footed and look things in the face and say, I'm not afraid because my father's got this. My daddy's got this. My father loves me so much that he will be with me even until the ends of the earth. He loves me so much that he will not allow anything to destroy me, no matter what comes. And death may be the thing that comes. I may have an illness. We could have illnesses that takes us unto death, but we will not be destroyed because when we live in him, when we accept him and his love into our lives, when we do Romans 10 and 9 and confess and believe in our heart that he is raised from the dead, that the moment that I take my last breath, woo, that this body that I have turns to immortal. The perishable body, the perishable body that I'm in right now turns into imperishable. When I accept him into my life, Romans 10 and 9, it begins a relationship with him. 
and it begins a journey with him that has peace and tranquility available to all of us. And I encourage you to get to know the Lord. You can't honestly say that you have a relationship with someone when you don't take the time to get to know him. Get to know who God is. Spend some time in his word. Prayer is just talking to God, like I'm talking to you right now. He already knows all about you. So just be transparent with him. Tell him what your fears are. Tell him what your concerns are. Just talk to God. Find a scripture that applies to your situation and speak that scripture out loud. Recite it out loud. Pray it in your prayers. Make it a part of your prayers. Get away from, throw away, cast aside all the I can'ts, all the I won't be able to figure it out, all of the I can't amount to anything. Do away with all that negative talk to your children. Do get away from all of that. And start speaking life into your life. Your words have power. Speak life and not death into your life. I want you to take your power back from this coronavirus, from this COVID-19. Take your power back from over your health issues. Take your power back over your mental stability. Take your power back in whatever you are going through. Because before there was corona, there were still abusive situations. There were still insecurities. There was still fear and anxieties. There was still health issues. There were still financial problems. There was still pride. There was still addictions before there was Corona. Before COVID-19, these things were in the world and they will still be here long after. So take back your power. Take back from fear and anxiety and depression and panic attacks through the word of God. Because this right here is prime time. God knew that we would face the time that the world is going through right now. And he knew it would push those who believe to a place of speaking his word out loud, of encouraging and proclaiming that he is God. So take advantage of this time that we have right now, where there are so many people who are offering you the word of God, the hand of God. And I want you to be blessed because he loves you. He loved you before you knew him. He loved you before you even could form your words to accept him. He loves you whether or not you choose to accept him. He loves you and he wants peace for you. So I pray peace over your life, over your family's life. And I pray that you are victorious in this fight against fear, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, all of it because it's available to you. Remember that I could have a lamp. It could be the most beautiful lamp you've ever seen. And I could sit it here, but that light would never shine until I plug it in to the electricity that's already available in the house. So God is here. His peace, his joy, his love, his comfort, it is all here and it is available to you when you have a relationship with him. And there are so many Christians today that are going through these same problems because you don't realize how much he loves you and that you already have access to this peace. Plug in to God, plug into his resources. Be blessed, I love you, God loves you, go with God. Amen.